All right. Hello. 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 Can you guys hear me okay in the back? Kind of feels like we're in a Zeppelin here if you look at the roof. <laughs> All right. Um, guys, thanks so much for being here. Uh, I'm going to try and keep this pretty light and somewhat casual. So what I want to do is talk about my experiences over the last 10 years um, creating an SDN company. Uh, this is kind of like a technologist's view of creating an SDN company and then bringing it to about a billion dollar run rate. And um, it's mostly a story of like what we got wrong, which was almost everything. Um, I gave a similar talk at a keynote um, at the Open Networking Summit, but uh, actually I changed a lot of stuff for this crowd because I wanted to focus on different things. And in particular, interactions with things like OpenStack and why that's treacherous for startups. So, so high order bit, uh, if any of you are out there aspiring to go like do your own company, this is kind of like things to be aware of and um, maybe some tribulations that'll be helpful. So for those of you that don't know, my name is Martin. Uh, so I was at Stanford uh, and did some of the original work that became SDN along with a bunch of other people. So Nick McCune and Scott Shanker and so forth. And um, so I graduated almost exactly 10 years ago. And at the time, I was going to go be a professor at Cornell, but instead, um, you know, I was convinced to, to create a company called Nasira. And I think, actually, probably one month to the date, it'll be a decade since we created that. And so what I wanted to first do is talk about kind of what we were originally thinking of when we created the company Nasira. Like, what was the basic idea? And then talk about how that evolved to what eventually became um, like the final product, which eventually became like this large run rate product. So the idea was, and, the, and by the way, a lot of these initial slides are from our original slide decks, right? So like we like go and we go pitch VCs. Um, so the original idea was like, okay, we thought that networking was fundamentally broken, um, and we kind of identified two problems. And a lot of this came from the research, which you just basically kind of repackaged and, and used as part of a pitch deck. So if you distill it down, we really f focused on two problems. One of them is if you looked at networking at the time, in order to like implement new functionality, it was often like implemented in an ASIC. So like any time, and by an ASIC I mean an actual like, like hardware chip. So any time you wanted a new type of functionality, for example like security or mobility or whatever, they would take the Ethernet frame format and they would change it and they would say, oh, listen, you need to go buy a new box in order to do this. And because like developing an ASIC takes what four years, ten million dollars, evolving the data path was really, really slow. So one problem that we focus on, we're like, actually, it's really hard to evolve networking if every time you want to do something innovative, you're spinning an ASIC. And then the second problem we looked at was we said another problem is is like networks are very complex and getting very big, but the way that we operate them or manage them is like box by box, and this is like requiring human beings to solve distributed state management, which is, I mean, it's hard to get programs to solve this. Getting humans to start to solve it is even more difficult. And so we thought, okay, listen, so there's two problems. One of them, we want more rapid innovation by basically taking functionality out of hardware. And two, we want to provide high-level global abstractions so that you can manage it from a high level. And again, like this idea, this very kind of high-level idea came out of the work that we did um, at, uh, at Stanford. OK, so how are we going to do that? So if you go back to the original slide decks, this is 2007. We had this kind of really high level idea and really no idea how to implement it. We're like, it's easy. All we're going to do is we're going to build this software layer that goes across the network. And so we're going to run these servers, the software layer, and then the functions, instead of having them in hardware, we're going to run them as applications at the software layer. And if we do that, now the functionality is in software, and you've got global abstractions because we've got this software layer. Um, and so we solved the operational problem. So that was kind of the high level view. And if you distill it down, we're saying, here are the two problems I talked about. We're going to build an SDN platform. We're going to target, for our first thing, is the virtual data center. And the reason we decided to target the virtual data center is because like, there was new build outs in virtual data centers at the time. Um, and it was like the operational problem was particularly complicated there. Because you know, VMs were coming and going and moving around, and in order for the network to keep pace, people had to run around and kind of update the state management. So we're like, okay, here's a problem domain that's acute. We're getting new build outs. That's what we're going to target. So like good academic computer scientists, we thought, okay, so to solve this problem, we're going to solve the problem in generality. And so we created a system. Uh, this is, we started this in 2007. 
which was supposed to be a basic platform to solve all of the world's SDN problems. And that system was called Knox. And the idea was the following. You have a server and you run software in that server and that server is going to manage all of these switches and that server is going to expose to programmers this API of a graph. So if people or developers want to manipulate networking state, they will operate on top of this graph. Um, I mean, it turns out, so we actually built this system, it was actually used in two production products, um, but we quickly found out that there were a couple of problems with it. Um, the first one is, so my background was actually as a computational physicist. So I was like a distributed systems guy that worked on big simulations. And it was very clear to me that we were actually tackling the problem as developers. When the reality is, is that networking, like writing software for networks, is primarily about distributed state management. So if you're writing, if, if I'm writing a platform like an operating system for a compute, what's gonna run on top of it? Like anything, right? We use compute to solve physics and to solve entertainment and to do word processing and to do business. I mean, the platform of compute is as general as possible, but when it comes to writing networking software, it really is just about moving the state on the network, and that's it, right? You always have the same list of things you wanna solve. I mean, for, I mean I've been in networking for 20 years, it's always forwarding, security, performance management, visibility. I mean, like, there's like a list of five things you want to do in the network and it doesn't change, and all of them are managing state at scale. And the second problem is we kind of assumed that if you sucked the brains out of all the switches and you put them in a single server, you could actually reduce the complexity that comes to distribution. So to build scalable networks, you actually have to distribute compute. It's an N squared problem. You've got N things talking to N other things, right? And so in order to to do that, you have to have some level of distribution. And we thought, well, if you're pulling, sucking the brains out of switches and you're pulling them into servers, maybe you can have two servers or three servers and you can actually limit the complexity. But the more we started building it, we realized that this is fundamentally a distributed problem. That is, if you're solving the problem for like three servers, you might as well solve it for five or 10 or something like that. So we decided to take another crack at this. And he said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Having one platform that's kind of more compute focused doesn't solve this problem. Why don't we build a general platform that, is help, that enables developers to build distributed applications for state management? So the idea is, is we're gonna make it easier for developers to build kind of distributed applications that will manage all switch state. To do that, we kind of went back to kind of what worked before and we're like, okay, so, the graph works. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, listen, if you wanna build some sort of a new network, we're gonna give you a graph, but now this graph is distributed, and that state is, dis is stored in like distributed, like distributed data structures or distributed data stores, and we're gonna give you a bunch of tools that you can use to operate on top of that state. Like we're gonna say, here's distributed locking, here's leader election, and now your job is easier because we've given you all these tools and you can build this controller that will solve all of networking problems, whether it's database or whether it's data centers or WAN or whatever. So the problem with that is, the first thing is we kind of realize there's no one networking problem. So, so when it comes to distribution, you're always making trade-offs between things like state consistency and scalability and correctness and we found for like every aspect of the network that was very different. Like a data center is very different than the WAN, is very different than mobile. So we couldn't really distill, you know, like here's the networking problem and here's a general component that you can use for all of them. And so what you end up with is you end up with just about as much complexity as you start off with. That is, if I create a platform for you, but like I need to provide as much generality as you need to solve all of these problems, you're not reducing complexity a lot. Like, I like to think of it as follows. Like, um, I, think, I think we do this as computer scientists a lot. Like, it's just like making your bed in the morning. Like, you wake up, and there's the bed, and there's like the bump on the bed. And so you're trying to make your bed, and instead of like getting rid of the bump, you just kind of move it around. Like, you like move it by the wall, and it looks nice. You like move it by the pillow, and it looks nice, or whatever, but you're not really getting rid of the bump. And in this case, I think what we've done is we've kind of taken that complexity, and we just kind of moved it to a different place, where we're just kind of putting the onus on the developers still to deal with distribution. But there was value in there, and I think that the primary value was the following, which is networking people at the time, and, and less so now, were protocol people. Like seriously, like if you wanted to have a conversation about implementing something, they'd go down to like bits and headers. 
where distributed system folks, I mean, this is a decade ago, we were talking about abstractions and state management. And so the one thing it did is for those working on the platform, they started to view networking as a distributed systems problem, not like a low-level implementation protocols problem. So there was definitely some value there, but I don't think we reduced complexity from like a developer standpoint. All right, so we're, we're working on this platform or trying to make the platform kind of help you know, everybody's problems. And then we figured, okay, well, we need to like build a product that people use and put into production. And so our thought is we're gonna build this thing we call the virtual network controller. I think the product had like seven different names in the life cycle of the company. But the idea was simple. It was like, listen, if you go to a virtual data center, the VMs have a certain operational model, right? They come up dynamically, they grow, they shrink, they move around, they disappear. They're often driven programmatically or through a UI, but networks aren't like that. Like networks are manually configured, so there's a mismatch between I want to provision compute and I want to configure the network. Again, guys, this was like 2008. So we thought, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna build this, this networking layer so that you can operate the network in the same way you operate a VM, right? You wanna make it totally programmatic and totally flexible. We weren't exactly sure how we were gonna do that, but that's what we were gonna kind of throw the SDN problem at. So along the way, and this is probably in 2008, we kind of had a realization that was the following. So um, I remember like starting to look at clouds at the time, and I walked into one of like the main cloud providers, and they were using an aggregation of 40 VMs per server. And that like blew my mind, because like, like if you take like, you know, like where I did my PhD, like the floor, like there's an entire floor where I did my PhD, and there were probably 40 servers on that floor. And all of those servers are now like, you know, and all of those servers are now running in one server. And in order to connect 40 servers in most work environments, you need networking. You need security, you need the ability to log. I mean, you actually need networking. So it was very clear that as servers were becoming virtual, a networking layer was being sucked into the servers. And, um, and you actually had to do really interesting stuff. And we actually had this posit that you could actually implement most of networking, security, QoS, visibility, at that software layer, and you could do it on x86 without actually having to implement it in an ASIC in the network. And at the time, by the way, this was a super radical idea. Like now we're like, oh, this is obvious, but at the time people were like, that's bullshit, like you can't do it. Um, so we started developing Open vSwitch at the time, um, and the idea was, okay, we're gonna have like this primitive that you can use to implement much of networking at a, to the network, and I think that turned out to be like one of these like fundamentally good ideas. I mean, it's all of the bad ones, that became a very good idea, and I'll talk later about why that was. On the other hand, we never could get the hardware ecosystem to work, ever. And by hardware ecosystem, I mean IHVs, independent hardware vendors, love to talk to software startups, whether it's like a Switch vendor or it's a NIC vendor, and they always go to the software startups and like, what can we put in the NIC to help you out? And we, I can't tell you how many resources we engaged with these big, huge IHV vendors to figure out like what you can put in hardware to speed up the software that we were doing. And that never worked. In the 10 years that I was like deeply involved in this, this never worked. And I think there's two real critical reasons. I've got th three here, but there's two reasons. One of them is really parsimony of function. Like the conversations were always the same, which is the hardware vendor would come up and say, hey, listen, we can do anything in hardware that you can do in software. That sounds amazing, okay, great, let's do it. And then we'd get down to talking about specific headers. And I remember once I had to argue for 16 bits as opposed to 15 bits. Now from a software person where like for me, like declaring a variable is like I can put a 64 or 128 by it, like this is ridiculous, right? But actually much more significant than that is it turns out hardware refresh cycles are incredibly slow, incredibly, incredibly slow. So now if you're a vendor of a switch, for example, or a server, you can deal with this because basically the hardware is going in the bits, the atoms that you're actually shipping. But if you're a software vendor and especially a startup, you kind of have to wait for them to show up. And so I just want to give you one, one example. So there was a company, it's actually in New York, it's a very large cloud that had been looking for hardware acceleration in NICs for tunneling for as long as I can remember. I remember having conversations seven years ago with them. So they're like, listen, at some point our NICs are going to have this hardware acceleration and then you can use it. So I was there about a month ago, and they still hadn't got that as part of their standard supply chain. 
seven years later, right? So like, it's just kind of this kind of waiting for Godot thing is if you're a software startup and you're hoping the hardware supply chain shifts, you really need to take into account not only the development cycle on that ASIC, and then that ASIC coming into like whatever board you need, but then you know that's gonna be in Taiwan and then wrapped around sheet metal and then put in a shipping container, then put on shipping switches, and then going into some uh, um, warehouse somewhere, and then you still have an entire refresh cycle before that actually pops up at the customer. So I think actually tying functionality from a software standpoint to hardware tends to be a pretty fatal mistake for startups. Okay, so then there was a the question of, okay, so we want to build this system which makes it easier to operate networks. And we kind of had an idea, I mean, it's an easy thing to say, which is we're like, today network operations are box by box and they're topology specific. How about we provide some high level interface that makes it really easy to do? And again, as, as, as good computer scientists, we solved the problem in its entire generality. We said the, the answer is obvious. We're gonna create a domain specific language and that domain specific language is gonna use high level names like Martins and whatever, group A and group B. So that's, that's topology and specific. So you make declarations at a business level, but it's a, it's a full language. I mean, this is a subset of data logs so you can express anything you want to express. And now everybody's happy because you can express exactly what you want um, and you do it in a way that's topology and specific. So now if you want to determine how your network runs, you just kind of write this policy language and everything's fine. So the, there's two fundamental problems for this, and this is uh, basically a non-starter. And if I ever, well, I'm probably not gonna do another company, but if I ever guide another company in this space, I would say never start with a domain-specific language for the following reason, which is what you want is you always want maximum expressibility and minimal complexity. Like that's, that's what languages are for. Many of us are programmers. We think that we're reducing the world. But at least in the networking space, we ran into two problems. The first one, it was never really clear that the languages we came up actually supported the entire set of semantics of networking. Like, we use networking for a lot of funky stuff, right? I mean, we've got PVLANs, we've got static routes, um, uh, we've got basic switching, we've got VLANs. I mean, like, there's all of these things that dictate connectivity on the data path. Of course, we've got broadcast and multicast, and it was never clear to me that you could actually express the full range of those things using a declarative language. But here's much, much more significant of a problem. It's like, if you have a set of users that are, are used to using something and thinking about that thing, there's a set of abstractions that are in their brain. In the case of networking, those abstractions are like L2 and L3 and whatever. As soon as you change those abstractions, you blow up people's brains. Like they don't even know how to think about what you're doing and the entire tool chain that was built on the old abstractions no longer applies to the new abstractions, right? I mean, if you think about it, networking's been around since the 70s and we've been talking about IP addresses and ethernet and all of this other stuff. And so not only is all of the literature written on it and all the tools written on it, but that's how people think. And all of a sudden I'm like, here, listen, data log. <laughs> and they're like, what is this stuff? And I think that this resulted in, in, at least for me, kind of the breakthrough that made everything really fall into place. Because until that point, and this is probably, say, 2009-ish, until that point, um, it, was, it, it felt like you were preaching something that people never really understood, and like every discussion was a knife fight. And so at this point, we're like, listen, you need topology-independent abstractions. That's clear. Um, you need it to be programmatic. You need them to be global throughout the entire network. Why don't we just make those abstractions the same as the physical abstractions and just call it a day, right? So why don't we, and this is entirely decoupled the physical network, why don't we just say, listen, if you want, let's say you have a data center and you've got VMs, if you want to attach them to something, attach them to a virtual network, it looks just like a physical network. It can do L2, it can do L3, it'll support whatever, NetConf or whatever you want. And you can put it in any topology that you want and you can control it globally um, through an API. And now you can manage the network just like you can your VMs, except for now this kind of globally decoupled abstract layer. And there's a whole bunch of uh, confusion around this, this concept to begin with. I mean, so when we first started it, I remember a lot of the answers were like, well, VLANs are virtualization. And, and I don't know if it's obvious now, but like there's a big difference between segmentation and virtualization. 
So what's segmentation? What's segmentation for like x86 days? Segmentation is if I give you a hardware resource, then I give you some identifier, and it slices that hardware resource, right? You segment it, right? So what does a VLAN do? It takes a physical topology and it'll segment it. That's very different than saying, I'm gonna give you any physical network, let's say an L3 network, and then on top of it, you can build any other network of any other configuration. So I can give you an IPv4 L3 network, and on top of it, you can create an L2 network, an IPv6 network, some complex funky topology, whatever you want. So the goal is to do like true, true address level virtualization, where you've really decoupled the hardware from the software. And that resulted in what became NSX. I mean, again, we went through a bunch of names, but it was basically building what we call the network hypervisor, which is kind of a stupid name. But the idea is, is if you have a data center and you're running VMs, you actually need networking abstractions to pull off all the stunts that networking normally does, whether it's visibility, whether it's QoS, whether it's firewalling, and all of that must match the operational model of, of the VMs. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. So we, we actually built this, we did it you know, using whatever mechanism, it's not really important. It was all, I mean, it was implemented using the vSwitches at the edge, so it didn't require any changes to the physical network. And we kind of thought we were done. We're like, okay, great. In the physical world, people buy switches independently of buying servers, right? So like they'll buy servers and they buy switches. That's what they want in the software world. <laughs> and it turned out not to be the case, um, which is, I don't think today, outside of boxes, physical boxes, anybody wants to differentiate between compute uh, networking and software. So you kind of go into these operations, say you're running a big cloud and you buy all of these switches from Cisco, here we've got this software layer that you can buy independently. And the reality, these guys are thinking actually no, <laughs> like, like listen, people consume compute networking and storage as a whole. I want to make sure that whatever we buy is the end-to-end -end workflow and not pieces that I've got to integrate and support separately. Um, and so we started working on, uh, on OpenStack, at the time it was Quantum and then Neutron. And so I gave my first talk at this conference in, uh, seven years ago, so it was 2010 in uh, San Antonio. And at the time, you know, we didn't really know how any of this stuff would play out. But the idea was, is like, we're going to you know, get behind a very promising project. And you know, it was very clear that OpenStack was gonna have a big impact. And I think it really has, and it continues to have a big impact. Why don't we kind of chisel out a network-shaped hole in there so any vendor can kind of plug their networking piece and then it'll all work in a way that's happy? And it was just kind of this base assumption that like, if you have an open source ecosystem like say OpenStack or whatever, it's easy to build some sort of pluggable framework so anybody can kind of bring their toy and plug it in and, and it works. And what we learned is that's really, really, really hard. I mean, it's a super seductive idea. It's like, we've got this open source project, and we're gonna make it pluggable, because we're all great architects and designers, and we're gonna have this flourishing vendor ecosystem. And in the long term, this is a, this is a um, path that's fraught for power for many startups. And I, I wanna try and describe why, because I think it's super relevant to this audience. Probably the, the biggest battle for startups is that if a customer is buying something, what they buy and who they buy it from has all the account control. Does that make sense? So if, like, if what I'm interested in is buying OpenStack, that's what I'm interested in as a, as a customer. And so if I buy OpenStack from vendor X, my relationship is with vendor X, and the support contract is from vendor X. And so from a startup's perspective, Either you have to have a separate sales motion, which now, like, who knows if Vendor X is gonna even support your thing, or you basically kind of hand over the keys to Vendor X in some way. And in my experience, one of two things happens, in, in every case that I've done. So, thing number one, if what you're doing is strategic. So let's say, um, let's say that, you know, Plucky Young Startup is working with Linux Vendor X. And we go to Linux Vendor X and we're like, okay, listen, we wanna provide you kind of this networking system, we're gonna go ahead and plug in. One of two things happens. Number one, you will kick off a build versus buy decision from Vendor X, every time. They're like, listen, are we gonna like allow like some like pipsqueak startup to kind of cram some bits in here and like, you know, potentially ruin the account? So you kick off a build versus buy decision, or if you're not strategic, you get no resources or the B team. And I've played this game tree out so many times, like every single time, build versus buy, or um, 
you get the B team. And in both cases, it's very difficult for you to maintain relevancy. I mean, often it's just better for you to try and do an independent sales motion, but then the, and you see this actually playing out today very often. Like, let's say you're selling networking, but you can't kind of crack kind of the, the vendor ecosystem. What you do is you're like, okay, I'm an OpenStack vendor now. So now you've like got this DNA of this company that's kind of like built you know, everything that it can, and you've become an entirely different company with an entirely different sales motion and sales model. So it's a very, very difficult thing for startups to do. I'm not saying you can't, I'm just saying it's difficult. Of course, open source often becomes proxy battlegrounds, and it's very, very difficult um, to, to project and manage around these things. Now what's interesting, is I think this really, like the more I thought about it and the more I went through my notes and the more I went through conversations we had, I think this really is primarily about um, young ecosystems. Like more mature ecosystems like Linux, clearly you can do this. And that's just because you don't need to have the same types of relationships with the vendors of Linux that you need to if something's changing all the time just because of like the shifting of APIs and versioning. So if it's an early project and you're a startup, beware. All right, I wanted to give you kind of a, kind of a relative time frame of the growth of the product. So the product was called MVP um, at the time. We were acquired by VMware in 2012, about five years after that. We kind of merged with an internal product to um, VMware called NSX. Um, and then, you know, we grew it. I guess it was just a few months ago, it was announced that this is now a billion dollar product line. So it became this very large product line. Um, and the reason I want to show you this is to kind of show the relative timelines for actually bringing something to market which is like, and I'll, 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 uh, I'll get to this a little bit later, but it, it turns out that like R&D and even finding product market fit are way, way less uh, relative investment than taking something to market and even more importantly, changing customer behavior. Okay, so a pop out is kind of a poorly dressed PhD student from Stanford. I think, you know, good technology wins the day. I kind of go through this gauntlet, this meat grinder for a long time. And one of the big lessons I learned is actually if, if, if you're building a company and you're sitting at the helm of that company and you're responsible for P&L, profit and loss, so like you're responsible for the balance sheet, it turns out pretty much everything that drives your life after, I don't know, you go to market is, uh, is actually go to market. Like that's it. And the reason this follows, and I, listen, I don't know if this is even of interest to you guys, but like um, if you find yourself in this situation, it's gonna be a hell of a wake up call. Forget the fact that you need to sell something or you need to market something or anything like that. The reality is for a business, you're judged on financials and all of your financials in an enterprise company are dwarfed by sales, full stop. Like that's it, that's your valuation, that's your margin, that's how people think of you, that's your reputation. It's all driven by the go-to-market costs. And the reason is as follows, and it took me a while to really understand that, but like R&D is kind of like this fixed cost. It's like this sublinear cost. Like, and that's the great thing about software is as you scale to tons of users, like you don't need to linearly scale your sales, or your, sorry, your engineering team, your R&D team, right? I mean, like, like a few engineers can build amazing products for the entire globe. And of course you have to grow it, but you can do it in a way that's sublinear. But when it comes to sales, that just isn't true. And in early markets, like pre-chasm markets, like nobody's ever thought of it type markets, like you need to do direct sales, so you need sales forces on the ground and they drive all of your cost. So it doesn't matter like how hardcore you are and how technical you are and how awesome your technology is. At some period of time, like your entire life is gonna be dictated by one motion that, by the way, for me, you have no training in order to do. And to put it in a little bit more perspective, this is kind of where we uh, spent the relative amount of time, which is, um, this isn't exactly to scale, so I kinda, I just, just to be perfectly honest, but like, um, technology development is really important, but like a lot of the reason that R&D actually spends so much time is because you don't know what you're building. <laughs> so like, you know, like you're going like, oh, we're gonna build a platform, we're gonna do this, it's not the right thing. And so you're kind of like wandering in the wilderness, you're trying to find product market fit. At some point you find product market fit and that takes time. So, I mean, that will often take years. Like I'm on seven boards right now. I mean, I'm an investor now, but Andreessen Horace right now, I'm on seven boards right now. I see lots of companies. I've made a number of investments and like there's this phase, unless you're very lucky where you're wandering in the woods and finding product market fit. And R&D always tries to keep up with that and often like if you do too much R&D up front then you've got to kind of uh, undo it later but all of this is dwarfed by the amount of resources needed to go to market all of it okay so I'm gonna talk quickly about lessons learned then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I think kind of the next big things are and then I'm happy to open it up to Q&A
So the key lessons for me that are my big takeaways if I distill like a decade of my life um, down are the following. Um, if I were to do it all over again, instead of like worrying about like solving the problem in all generality, because I'm a great computer scientist and like building a general platform, et cetera, I would have just focused on the product and I would have gotten to market much, much sooner. Um, I probably, we probably lost two years from that. Um, the second thing is I think you should think very, very carefully before changing abstractions. I think this is the PaaS versus the AWS model, right? Like people know, and, and it's, it's not a technology issue, it's a, the way that people's brains work. Like putting concepts in people's brains, like people wake up and they think about X things, changing those things they think about is hard. It's like the Leonardo DiCaprio like inception thing. Like you've gotta go in and actually change how people think. It's a very difficult thing. So if you can keep abstractions as they are, much better. Software for the win for sure and sales and marketing. Okay, so let me uh, talk a little bit about the future. Um, and this is fairly quick, but I think this is kind of where the world's going, at least the, the areas that I'm interested in. Uh, so I think networks are basically defined by what they connect. Like a network by itself doesn't mean anything, right? It's a bunch of wires, it's a bunch of connectivity, right? And like, actually what you put in a network is a function of the needs of what it connects, right? So if you look at physical servers, physical servers, you give them Ethernet NICs that have L2, they want L3, and then there's an operational model around servers of like you have to pick them up and move them, so if you want to go walk and configure the network when you do that, that's fine. So if you have a physical build out of servers, you can do a physical build out of networks, you're fine. And that's why networks look the way that they do in the physical world. Uh, virtual machines change that a little bit. Again, virtual machines have NICs, they run legacy applications, you don't change anything, so you still have to support L2 and you still have to support L3. But the operational model shifted, right? Now you have a virtual operational model where things come and go and move around and everything else, and so you want network abstractions that follow that operational model, and this is where network virtualization came in. All right, so um, you could make an argument, and I'm not making that argument, that you know containers have a bit, bit of a different operational model, right? I mean, don't really care about L2. Um, it's more about application deployment and um, application portability as a use case, so maybe we need something like that's like virtual networking for L3. But I actually think that that would be a mistake to view that the way the world is going. And I think everybody thinks that's the way the world's going, or many people think that's the way it's, the world's going, but it's more and more clear to me that actually networking is jumping up a level. And so what I think is really happening is all of networking is jumping up to the API level. And I think that's probably one of the most significant changes we've seen in the history of networking. And I want to talk a little bit about why that is. And so if I were to make a guess, yes, you're going to need networking or uh, container level stuff, sure. Um, uh, but I think that the action is really now at the HTTP, REST, JSON kind of API level. So let me kind of lead up to that very quickly. Um, <laughs> Okay, I know this is Google Trends, I know it's kind of funny, but like, um, even, it, even if a bad first order approximation, it's like, a, you know, somewhat of an insight of what's on people's minds. I've actually been schlepping the, uh, the commute on 101 between Silicon Valley and San Francisco for 17 years, almost two decades, and while I go back between San Francisco and there, like, the billboards have always been kind of what's on Silicon Valley's mind, and let me tell you, over the last maybe year or so, it's, uh, it's, um, they're talking about companies whose primary interface is APIs. Um, and this just happened kind of overnight. I mean, you've got uh, multiple billion dollar companies whose primary interface is an API. You've got kind of APIs for everything. You've got tons of GMV, which is actual dollars going through APIs today. So I think we're seeing this kind of massive shift moving from like content web centric stuff to APIs. Does that make sense? Well, I think the end point, I mean, the end point used to be a physical server or a VM or a container, it's very, very clear to me now applications are basically becoming distributed components connecting APIs, right? So this is a non-trivial statement. I'm saying like, listen, to build an application today, instead of stringing together a bunch of machines, what developers are thinking about are distributing a bunch of APIs together and using whatever they use to do it. And I think that's driving like kind of the most exciting technologies, which like I'm starting to think of as, as um, uh, as networking technologies. I mean, like, we never had this level of interest in anything I've ever built ever, right? So I'm actually on the board of, of MashApe, which develops Kong, so it's a, it's a company I'm familiar with. But if you look at, like, these growth statistics, they're unbelievable. 
And so if you want to think about it, it's like, okay, and by the way, so that includes um, Linkerd, Rapid, and Envoy. Like all of these are technologies that are interposed, providing what you would consider network-like functionality, things like discovery, fault tolerance, failover, load balancing, security, all of that's being implemented, but it's being implemented at like a much, much more interesting layer. And like if you actually look at the interest in these technologies, I mean, it's going asymptotic. And so, I just want to leave you with this, and I'm happy to open it up to, to questions after, but like, there's long been in networking this holy grail of like semantic networking. It's something that we've always wanted to do and have never been able to do, and let me talk about what that means. So here's what networking, the networking problem has been since the 70s, which is I have a box, and a packet comes in that box, and I look at the packet headers, which is this random arbitrary set of bits that doesn't mean anything, and I make a decision to drop or send that packet. That's the networking problem, that's it. So what are the decisions made of? IP addresses, they mean nothing, right? They're a location on the internet, they're not even a box because of rebinding, right? I have no idea who's doing it, I have no idea what operation is being doing, I know nothing. For me, I just, I'm setting packets from point A and point B. And people have always wanted semantic space networking, but if you think about it, because now you actually have reasonable endpoints, things like APIs, and applications are written in a way, and this is the most important thing, applications are basically written in a way to take advantage of these endpoints, we're seeing the emergence of an entirely new layer in components that are taking off, which allow you to interpose and make decisions on that layer. So for example, now, if I have, let's say I'm using um, an HTTP mesh in a data center for like a Kubernetes deployment, I can dictate that that mesh make intelligent load balancing decisions based on whatever, like, like what, the, what resource is actually being um, modified. Or let's say I wanna make a security decision, I can differentiate between like a put and a get. So now like instead of like these really crude approximations that haven't worked for a really long time, we're actually seeing the evolution of networking to actually have be semantically aware, which honestly, like if that gets rid of all of networking and kind of replaces it for application development, I think this is a good thing. So with that, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to spend with me. I'm happy to open it up to questions. So thanks so much. Please. And thank you. Hi, Martin, big fan. Thank you. I'm lucky to be here. So I have three questions. Sure. The first one is related to the OpenStack deployment. Yeah. So the, what are, by today, what is available from open source community to use with OpenStack Neutron, either, either Open Contrail or go with ODL or ONOS versus yet another paradigm with the Calico layer three only. Yeah, yeah. So what the, what's, what's your thought on this? The, this is the first question. Yeah. The second one is regarding the switch to product itself. There's, yeah. a, there's a shift and there's a, there's a momentum delivering transactional Linux running inside the switch, such as CoreOS or Ubuntu Core, yeah, yeah. to have a snaps in it as a, with a squash FS, yeah. having the applications yeah. inside as a firewall or load balancing. Yep, 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 yep. And the third one is. Let me, let me, let me answer this. So the first, okay. So let, let me get this one at a time because I'll forget this is great. These are great questions. The first question is I honestly don't know. Like I've actually been out of the OpenStack world um, as far as kind of the network vendors for a while. Um, and so I'm not the right person to answer that. Like, I mean, I've, I've got my ideas from like four years ago, but like literally when I got uh, acquired by VMware, like the primary focus was the, the vSphere ecosystem. And so I just don't want to say something that's irrelevant. Second question is a, a, a great question. So I think now that we actually have a reasonable networking layer that's, that's the HTTP layer, I think the data center of the future is converging and it's very clear. The data center of the future is you've got an L3 networking fabric that's probably a fat tree and everything else is x86, everything, everything. So I don't see any reason to put you know, any software that isn't doing L3 forwarding of packets in the network. I don't see any reason to um, try and put middle boxes in the network or get them close to switching or anything like that. I think that it's just like chassis design. So like if you get a chassis from like say Cisco, you've got you know, line cards that have a bunch of intelligence and you've got a backplane that they connect to. I think the physical network becomes that backplane and the line cards have all the intelligence. And I think all that intelligence is gonna be on x86 and I hope that the networking functionality is gonna be implemented at a semantically meaningful layer, which is like the HTTP layer or something like that. Does that make sense? And so I, I, so I, I don't think that, the, like, I think, I, I think often as computer scientists, we overgeneralize everything, so we're like, listen, you've got a switch, and it's got a CPU, so I'm gonna containerize that CPU. Like, there's no point. 
right? I think you're just misunderstanding the fundamental technical problems when you decide to do these types of things. And so I think that like, you listen, the networking people are gonna continue to be focused on protocols and containers and low-level stuff for a long time. And all the while, the rest of the world is gonna pass it up and basically re-implement all of these things as a proper distributed system. Okay. Yeah, I mean, your answer makes sense in the sense that Intel is pushing RexCare with the backplane communication with the photonics design and so on, but the reality today is we still buy and deploy pizza boxes going oh, top of No, 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 sorry, sorry, I, 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 I misspoke, right? I wasn't clear. I think the physical network will be an L3 fabric from whatever vendor you want in whatever physical configuration, it's gonna be 10% of the total data center spend, and that's it, end of story. I, don't, I can't think of any innovation you actually want to do in that physical network. I mean, I don't know what else you'd put in there. I don't know what like, you know, virtualizing like this wimpy CPU that's driving a Broadcom chip buys anybody. So for me, when I think of a data center, I abstract the entire physical network as like one big L3 switch and I call it good. And I don't do any more implementation. Then you say, okay, so now I've taken the entire physical network and I've abstracted it away. Then you say, what about middle box functionality? My belief is we're actually building proper distributed systems, thank goodness, because of microservices. And so things that we normally put in the, the network, things like discovery, things like load balancing, things like security, things like fault tolerance or fault isolation, that is gonna move into basically the HTTP layer, whether it's something like Linkerd or it's, um, Envoy or it's an API gateway or whatever. So, and those all run on x86, right? Because they're, and they're gonna be fundamentally distributed by nature. So I think that's the, evo that's the evolution. So you should think about physical network connectivity and then microservices and a distribution harness to, to manage that above it. My last question is sure. around your semantics. Yeah. Doing more using, using semantics in the sense of service function chaining yeah. What we saw kind of in the last two years, going with the service function chaining, inventing it with the NSH header sort of thing, that, yeah. that is literally facing what you face by means of the people tied with the protocols, yeah, exactly. like, like yep. Yep. change the yep. header format. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so, so NSH was kind of um, an attempt to do you know, network virtualization or overlaying by again changing like protocols and header formats and, and whatever. So I think this is, a, this is actually a great example. Like let's say you want to do something new in networking. You could like create like a new packet format and a new set of headers that everything needs to understand and the network needs to understand. Or, you know, you build a new microservice and you add data to it and it's just, you know, a part of like an HTTP get and, and, and life goes on. And I think if you actually look at like wh where effort is being spent and what's being adopted, it's very clear to me that all of this stuff is moving up to the, the application layer and like um, the rest of it's just gonna um, uh, atrophy over time. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Yeah, good presentation. Uh, Thank you. I follow up on the API, yeah. the evolving networking towards the API. Yeah. And these solutions, these service management solutions like LinkedIn, the et cetera, they yeah. use provide that abstraction within a domain, within a closed domain. Uh, great question. Once, once yeah. you leave the domain, yeah, yeah, you still question. go back to IP, BGP, Technologies that we No, great question, great 80, question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, awesome question. Yeah, yeah, no, this, this, this is a great question. So, well, I'll let you finish before I, <laughs> I So my in. question was, do you see why did the networking evolving away from IP? I mean, there have been attempts like ILNP, yeah. but nothing really took off. It's still IP, and all this innovation happens within closed domains, yeah. and you leave it, Go back yeah. to the old days. So, what, what's your view on yeah. that? Yeah, I, I think IPv4 is, is is it. I think that's the internet. I think that um, that and that's not going to change. So, just like the data center is now an L3 um, connectivity backplane, I think the core is going to be an L3 connectivity backplane, and then all the semantics are going to move up a layer. So, you're going to have companies like Rapid API, which are going to like provide basically uh, API arbitration services online, and they exist today. You can like find APIs, you can look for APIs, you can use them. So, just like the web was built on top of like IPv4 and then we built CDNs and everything else to support it. And like that was kind of like, because there wasn't great semantics, that was kind of a mess. I think now we have microservices as endpoints instead of the web. And we're gonna have a whole layer of infrastructure that's gonna provide support for that. So with that, I'm getting, I'm getting pulled off. Okay, cool. Thanks so much for your time, guys. Thank you.